you know, I, I never uh, imagined in my career receiving this honor. No journalism professor at Texas Tech ever imagined me receiving <laughs> this honor. Uh, but it, it is truly, to all of us at CBS, uh, such a, a great honor to be awarded this marker in the excellence of journalism on, on behalf of Walter Cronkite, who not only did such great things for us at CBS, but also for Arizona State University and the magnificent students over there. What an amazing facility you have built. It is truly one of the things that gives me so much hope for journalism in our future. I love having people in a room because usually I am at the mercy of the remote control and I am just one thumb click away from oblivion. It having a captive audience, which is what you are, reminds me of a time that I went to uh, Lake Placid with my, uh, my son. He was just a little boy at the time, probably 11 years old, and I had made special arrangements for us to get a canoe. It was a beautiful fall day, and I, we had this canoe, and we were going to go out at first daybreak. Every father's dream. We went out. The leaves were golden and red, and the deer were jumping, and the loons were calling, and the mist was rising from the lake. We pushed off in this canoe, every father's dream. And I remember hearing the soft, sweet sound of my little boy's voice when he said, Dad, do we have to do this? <laughs> So for the next 20 minutes or so, you are mine. You do, <laughs> you do have to do this. And God bless you for all of the support that you've afforded this magnificent university. To paraphrase, I knew Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was a friend of mine. And I'm no Walter Cronkite. <laughs> Everything that I have accomplished in journalism has been the result of producers, executive producers, cameramen, editors, artists, associate producers. I've never done anything in television journalism by myself. I am a man who gets far too much credit for the work of others. I am indebted to the leadership of CBS News over all of these years. The leadership of CBS News, which is now embodied by David Rhodes, our CBS News president, by Jeff Fager, who you saw in the video, the executive producer of 60 Minutes, who was the man who went way out on a limb and put me in the evening news when a lot of people were telling him it was a terrible idea, including myself. <laughs> and I'm also indebted to uh, my friend Steve Kappas, the executive editor of CBS News, the executive producer of the Evening News, my partner. Ladies and gentlemen, if you value quality journalism, it is Steve Kappas who deserves your applause this morning. And my friend Byron Harris is here from Dallas. Uh, anything that I ever learned about investigative reporting, I learned from Byron in our years together at WFAA. So Byron, thank you so much. What I've achieved, I've achieved, as I said, with the talents of all of these people, the talents that they have that I've never mastered over these 45 years. For all of us at CBS News, it's particularly meaningful to accept this award on behalf of all of those people on the 100th anniversary of Walter Cronkite's birth. Walter is alive and well at CBS News, and we live his values and his principles every day. Hundreds of people have created my career. 
but one person has given me my life. And that is my wife of 35 years, Jane, who is with us today. She is and always has been my North Star, and she is the author of Our Happy Family. Thank you, darling. And as we all know, behind every successful man, there is a surprised woman. <laughs> you know, sometimes I worry about the future of the greatest country on earth, our wonderful, durable republic. And I worried all the more as we watched both sides, both sides cheapen the electoral process during this last year leading up to election day. And so I've been feeling a little bit down about all of that. And then yesterday, I was at Arizona State University and I met about 70 of the students, young people who were on fire for journalism. And I feel so much better. I really owe you that. <laughs> Completely lifted my spirits. The Cronkite School today is training the young people who will defend our nation and will preserve the hope for freedom in the world. That sounds terribly pretentious, and let me explain to you why it is not at all. There is no democracy without journalism. And the quality of our democracy is bound tightly to the quality of our journalism. The folks at home, or wherever they are these days, need to have quality, unbiased, clear information to make decisions in their own lives, in the lives of their family, and in the life of the country. It is the only way a democratic republic of ours can work. It is the life blood of freedom, and that is what is being taught and well learned at ASU now. Quality journalism is not a given. We have come to take it for granted. It is not a given. Like all of our other freedoms, it must be fought for, it must be refreshed by every generation of Americans. There are threats now, to the quality of our information, to the quality of our journalism, threats that must be reckoned with. Consider this, never in human history has more information been available to more people. That's a wonderful thing. But it is also true that never in human history has more bad information been available to more people. Since the 1990s or so, we've been told that the dividing line in media is a line between legacy media and new media. But I believe we're past that definition, that we've now entered a post-revolutionary period in media, so that everything is available all the time. The CBS Evening News, 60 Minutes, are available on all platforms. You can see them anywhere all the time, and that is true for most media in the country today. We're past that point. What I want to suggest to you today is that there is a new dividing line that we must pay urgent attention to right now. That dividing line in the media is the difference between journalism and junk. It is the difference between quality, well-run newsrooms and what I consider to be three threats to our traditions of journalism. First, there are the aggregators, those sites and channels that just report other people's reporting, 
without bothering to verify whether those stories are true or whether the facts are straight. There are the purveyors of bias that lull viewers into a partisan coma on the left and the right. And finally now, and most insidious of all, we have the advent of the charlatans who publish and broadcast and post outright lies with no regard for the values that we celebrate here today. These charlatans are on a quest to come up with headlines for their stories that are so outrageous they will develop a lot of clicks and a lot of likes and the algorithms that power the Facebooks and the Googles of the world are based on the number of clicks and likes individual articles receive. One recent example was a fake news article before Election Day that said that Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump. A lot of us think that's pretty funny. A lot of us know the difference, but here's the thing. That was fed by the Facebook algorithm to one million Facebook news feeds. No human being involved, just the algorithm reacting to the fact that a lot of people were clicking on that story. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, defended his social media site by saying, and I quote, Determining the truth is complicated. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. In fact, determining the truth is so daunting, so complicated, that people go to universities and study how to determine the truth. <laughs> it's called journalism. Now, to its credit, Facebook is right now experimenting with filters that will capture some of these false stories and expunge that malicious content. But the bigger question is, for all of us going into the future, what is the responsibility of a Facebook or a Google? Are they utilities? Are they unconscious conduits that pass along any and all information without any responsibility to use human intelligence and the standards of journalism to stop false reporting? What is the responsibility of the audience? Is it completely up to us to see these stories and make a decision about whether we want to give them credibility or not? I had a rousing argument with my son over this, over dinner in New York the other night. And so what I realized for my son is I don't have the answer to this question. But what I do know is people that are a whole lot smarter and a whole lot younger than me need to have this debate. Because this is going to be one of the things that is a powerful influence on information going into the future. The stakes are enormously high. Think of this. Is terrorism the greatest threat to our country? Or a recession? I suggest to you today that the quickest, most direct way to ruin a democracy is to poison the information. Those are the stakes that we have to address. In an article not long ago in the New York Times, one of the managing editors of one of these recent news sites said, well, you know, if we get a million clicks on a story and that story turns out to be wrong, we still got the million clicks. That is the end of American greatness if the quality of our information on which the Republic depends is no longer sacred. 
At the turn of the century, distribution was revolutionized. Many more channels of information became available. But the principles of journalism never change, even in the midst of that media revolution. It doesn't matter whether you're writing on a glass tablet or a stone tablet. The values of reporting and journalism are immutable. We ask ourselves, is it right? Is it fair? Is it honest? Another trend that worries me is this trend toward biased reporting in all of its forms on the left and on the right. This is growing in popularity because what these people traffic in is confirming information. They tell you that what you already believe is right. What a wonderful feeling. Everything I already think is right. Well, then that has become a pretty successful business model. Lots of people love to hear that. I once, in fact, I once asked a neighbor of mine why he didn't take the daily paper. And he thought about it for a moment, and he said, I like what I know. <laughs> well, don't we all? In fact, the Facebook newsfeed algorithm is biased in favor of bias. It selects information that is popular among like-minded people and distributes that information to other like-minded people. And so we're becoming a nation of information tribes. We're in our digital citadels, unchallenged, by ideas. Biased reporting closes minds. Journalism is meant to open them. After the election, we're thinking a great deal, of course, about division in our country. We're used to, in the years past, we're used to reporting about swing counties, counties in this country that could go either way. But this year, my elections and polling unit told me that there aren't any swing counties in America anymore, no swing counties in America. We have separated ourselves physically, one from another. And so journalism today is the vital bridge that connects those communities. We often hear the rallying cry, united we stand. That's not the strength of America. The miracle of America is divided we stand. We are the most diverse nation on earth, and yet we can see past those things that divide us and all agree on this bigger idea of a democratic republic, the bigger idea that we are all Americans and we all belong here. Journalism is the medium through which we have that conversation. It's how we understand one another. It is how we respect one another. It is how we have empathy for one another's ideas. The alternative is a new Cold War, this time a civil war. Walter Cronkite was famous for being the most trusted man in America. Boy, those were the days. Those were the days that there were three television channels, as God intended. But today we live in a much more skeptical society, and you know, for the most part, really, that's a good thing. I am reminded as I ride around this room on my high horse that uh, we would do well in journalism to examine our own flaws, our own hubris. A serious dose of humility would do us all a world of good. 
we have brought a lot of this skepticism down upon ourselves. It damages our collective credibility as journalists when some journalists reach for fame rather than public service. It's the same instinct that leads some to embellish their stories or embellish their roles in the stories because it's more important to be admired than to report the news. They're grasping for popularity and have forgotten that journalism has nothing whatever to do with being popular. If you report without fear or favor or bias, you are very likely to be unpopular. And that is our role. That is our role as journalists. Let me tell you about a reporter, a Syrian reporter that I met and spent a day with uh, in southern Turkey about two months ago. His name is Hadi Abdullah. You've never heard of him. Nobody has. Hadi is a resident of Aleppo, never intended to be a journalist, but as the Assad dictatorship and its Russian allies rebelized Aleppo and blasted it into a pre-industrial region. Hadi got a camera, had access to YouTube, and decided that the world had to know what was happening. So he posts these YouTube posts one after another after another, and apparently the Assad regime noticed because one day Hadi went home to his apartment, opened the door, and boom, a booby trap went off. The bomb killed his cameraman and took most of one of Hadi's legs and part of the other. After enduring 12 surgeries in Turkey, Hadi Abdullah got in a wheelchair and went back to Aleppo and continued his reporting. That's a journalist. Those are the values that we celebrate here today. He is the purest form of a journalist, a human being striving to help humanity. Who asks, is it right? Is it fair? Is it honest? Those are the values that made American journalism the best in the world. They are the values that Walter Cronkite lived and defined. And they are the values that Arizona State University is teaching the young people like the ones that I met the other day at the Walter Cronkite School. The stakes are high. We need great journalists in this country. And I am so encouraged by the work that I've seen being done here. I'm enormously humbled by this honor. Enormously grateful that all of you are here and I thank you one and all from the bottom of my heart.